it's all gone, gone, gone quiet, so I think that is probably my cue to restart. Um, well, welcome back to the uh, final, final session of, 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 of t t today, and I'm going to introduce Naomi Luxford, who's, who will be giving our final talk. She's a conservation scientist working at English, English, in, English Heritage, whose current, current research projects include environmental control within collection stores, suitability of underfloor heating within historic houses, use of mesh blinds in historic properties. And who, who, who previous researchers looked at UVC for cleaning mold on architectural stonework, and, and also looking at a wide range of objects, including silver, textiles, furniture, etc. Her primary interests are in preventive conservation, conservation science, and conservation research, focusing on the building, its environment, and the <laughs> and the collections, and understanding their interactions to pres improve preservation. She is she's, she's taught at, at uh, City and Guilds of London Art School, West Dean College, UCL, and the Royal College of Art, and now Imperial College. <laughs> Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to finish up by talking about environmental monitoring and control, very much with an English heritage perspective. So for those of you that work in other collections, a lot of this will feel familiar, but hopefully you'll get something about how, how we to do it at English heritage and the kind of complexity of the situation. So English Heritage, for those who don't know, was a charity formed in 2015, slightly confusingly predated by English Heritage, founded in 1983, which split in 2015 to form Historic England and English Heritage, although earlier incarnations include things like the Ministry of Works. And we care for over 400 historic buildings, literally across the whole of England, and ranging in a variety of different types of sites. So here you can see Roman remains, ruined castles, uh, ruined monasteries, obviously the very famous Stonehenge, and also historic houses. And these historic buildings and the kind of statutory limitations of them is one of our complexities. Many of these are scheduled ancient monuments. You cannot drill a hole without getting a huge amount of permissions first. And so how we do things is often dictated by that restriction in itself. Although you can see quite a lot of ruins on the screen, not all of our museums are in ruined parts of the buildings. We also have a number of kind of more modern museum buildings on site, or in some cases, historic museum buildings on site. And within the collections, we have around 120 sites with collections and around a million objects scattered across the country. And those are seen as the movable things that live within the buildings or the museum spaces. So it's not the greatest image, I'm going to apologise, but it was the only one that I could find that really showed the geographical spread. So everywhere you can see a bit of text or the little red English Heritage logo within England, there is one of those 400 sites. These black dots mark the ones that have got collections, and within that, the coloured ones, which hopefully you can just see, are the ones that we have some form of environmental monitoring in. So you can see that geographically, our environmental monitoring is spread across the entire country from the very tips of Cornwall right up to the Scottish borders. We're also, it should be said, a very small team for the size of collections and the distribution across the country. So just over 28 of us, made up of conservators, scientists, and other specialists. And we're delivering quite an ambitious programme across those sites, um, not just in terms of environmental monitoring and control, but also in terms of the actual um, preventive conservation that happens on the site. And our primary aim is to reduce the risk of damage to the collections and interiors. And one part of that is to use conservation science to understand and mitigate those risks that face the collections and the buildings. And that's where the conservation science team comes in. One of our primary ways of understanding the risks to our collection is to use our national collections audit, which many of you won't necessarily have come across. This uses a condition survey of the actual objects, the collections across the sites, across the country, and we look, depending on the, the site, at a different percentage. 
and we use a risk assessment. And those two things are combined in order to look at where our biggest risks are and what our biggest risk factors are. And we then use that to draw up our actions for the next 10 years, at which point it's repeated and we look again at what are our biggest risks and how do we mitigate those risks. We also, in terms of the science, use damage functions where these are available to, in conjunction with the environmental data that I'm going to discuss. So within conservation, quite commonly, we see these 10 agents of deterioration used within risk management. And preventive conservation often focus on, on all of these 10 areas. Within English Heritage, we use a slightly different list, primarily based on what we can deliver and how we deliver it. So still 10 things, but it's very much focused towards the way that our team operates and the way that we deliver things. And this is what we're looking at. And primarily within science, we're often focusing on the display and storage conditions, the um, humidity, inherent deterioration, and light as part of that, although we overlap with the other areas. So some case studies to really set out how we do this and how our environmental monitoring and control works. This is Apsley House in London. For those who don't know or aren't familiar with it, it sits on the corner of Hyde Park. Um, hopefully this also gives a good flavour of one of the big challenges, which is the level of pollution because of the roads circulating it. Um, image there from the London Air Quality Network showing the nitrous oxide levels um, and really a kind of very heavily polluted urban site that we have to manage. As a result, we've historically done a lot of pollution monitoring at Apsley House from very simple metal coupons in the top um, left image through to continuous corrosion monitoring in the other two top images. And then also things like diffusion tubes, different types of metal coupons, test decimeters as part of EU projects, all to try and understand both what the pollution levels are at Apsley House, but also then how it's starting to affect objects or materials that are cited within that collection. And one of the um, continuous monitoring or data from some of the continuous monitoring was compared by the company for different sites that they'd monitored across the world. Their equipment had been used to monitor from 428 sites across primarily Europe and North America but a range of different sites. And Apsley House came out with the fourth and fifth highest levels of pollution. Um, they defined 300 Armstrongs and above as not acceptable, and we were measuring around 1,100. So we're significantly higher in terms of the pollution, um, pollution rates and the tarnish levels that that will cause. And that's particularly concerned because we have a big silver collection at Apsley House, including, as you can see, this centerpiece on open display for a sense of scale. This is eight metres by one metre by three quarters of a metre. You can see the level of intricate detail on it. Um, when it was cleaned previously to English Heritage taking on this collection in, uh, by the V&A, it took 1,700 hours of cleaning and relacquering. So this is a significant piece, and this is just one of the silver items within the collection. So this is something that poses a particular challenge to us. The other challenge when English Heritage took on Apsley House in 2005 with this heating system, very much a um, comfort heating system for the residents. It's the Duke of Wellington's home um, and the family still have the large part of the house. It has to be said there's only a small fraction of it open to the public um, and it is heated for comfort, which is not necessarily ideal for collections. So to give you an example, this is an infrared image from behind, or thermal image of behind those panel, those chairs. And these were regilded and started flaking pretty much immediately going back onto display. And part of that was the temperature of that radiator. That is actually the wall. They concealed the radiators as the wall panels below the dato rail. So you touch the wall and it would be red hot. Um, and so this was something we wanted to tackle when we took on Apsley House, but has something that is has to be said, still a work in progress some years later. Um, as part of that, we looked at installing underfloor heating. And one of the big questions with underfloor heating, we have wall carpets in the display rooms on the first floor where this was going to be used. Is that going to off gas more because we've got a heat source underneath it generating more pollution? Wool, when it breaks down, produces carbon sulfide, which will tarnish silver. So are we essentially generating more of our own pollutants by heating under the floor? So we did a trial with one of the continuous monitoring systems and compared what was going on elsewhere in the house where, with the, where we were doing the trial of the underfloor heating system. And essentially, we saw no measurable distant difference, primarily partly because outside is so polluted that it's a very minimal increase. So we went ahead in using heat mats, uh, a type of essentially connected underfloor heating. 
And we're using this to do conservation heating on the first floor. So for those who've never come across conservation heating, this means using hydrostatic control rather than thermostatic control. So the heating will turn on if the RH is too hot and it will dry the air out. And if it conversely gets too dry, the heating turns off and we let it get cold. I'm not the most popular member of staff in many of our historic houses in the winter, it has to be said, but this is how we kind of take our, in terms of our control. So we have a, an insulating layer against the floor. We then have our heat mats and you can see the electrical tails there. A series of boards, and this was the laying out process that sit on top because this was something that had to be able to be walked on and that was for an electric heat mat, that's something that's quite a big concern. And then because we, as I said, we've got limitations to do with historic houses and to do with um, how we do things, we obviously can't shave the bottom off the door if the floor height gets higher because we've added a heat mat. So what we ended up doing is the heat mats just sit in the middle of the room and then we've got these graded slopes of the boards that sit on the edges so that the carpet sits neatly over the top. You can't see that that's, there is a slope, there is, it's kind of imperceptible, people don't fall over it, it's not a trip hazard but it meant that the doors still closed over the carpet without any problems. Um, so these are kind of the sorts of things that when we're talking about practicalities, it's very much a how do we actually do this on site with the, the situations that we have. We then wanted to monitor that. So we've added some surface temperature monitoring and you can hopefully see we have a transmitter over here, a very tiny little cable and our surface temperature probe is here just hiding behind the piano leg, which when you see it from the visitor angle, essentially is completely hidden. And that allowed us to see, is the heat mat coming on? Is it doing, coming on when we think it will come on? And how are they working? And so you can see here, two different surface temperatures in two different rooms, one on, one not on. And it should be said that the, the temperature of these is designed to be quite low. So they're not designed to heat in the way that a hot water system would heat in that 50 degrees that we got behind the furniture. They're designed to be much cooler with a maximum operating temperature of about 35 degrees. So with our environmental monitoring, we can look at very simple dashboards, what's happening where, do we have alerts, do we have any particular problems. We can also do things like annual reporting. So in this case, for the government indemnity scheme, which essentially provides a form of insurance for a number of collections, English heritage, essentially all of our loan collections are covered by government indemnity. But as part of that, we have to report back to the Arts Council every year, what are the environmental conditions, how are these objects being looked after. And so in this case, we just send a very simple annual graph for all of the spaces. I say very simple. We're sending somewhere in the excess of 500 graphs a year. So it's not a simple process to send all of that data. It takes time. But it, for us, it's a lot less time than some of the data processing that might go with it if we were to do more kind of extensive reporting. We've also used the data to make predictions. So as I said initially, when we took it over, the heating being a particular problem, very high temperatures. And so looking at if we could drop that temperature by three degrees, what impact would that have on the relative humidity? So you've got the actual data, temperature in red and relative humidity in blue, and the recalculated relative humidity with those three degree lower temperatures in green. It's still not ideal for collections, particularly not organic materials like we have in Apsley House, but it's a lot better than it was. It's a lot less dry. It's likely to cause a lot less damage to the collections that are displayed. This was initially hoped that we could potentially get the temperature of the hot water system turned down slightly as you're using this. It turns out like with lots of historic houses, heating systems are not that straightforward. It's a historic system itself. You can't just go and tweak a thermostat or a temperature set point on a, hot, on a boiler somewhere. And so that's why it's taken us a lot longer to start to remedy these things. We still have the hot water system in the, fair, in the ground floor and the basement areas. That's much more of a work in progress to do with how the systems interact with other areas of the house. However, we can see if we compare one of the ground floor rooms, the inner hall, with one of the first floor rooms that's now on the conservation heating, that that lower temperature, which we can see in the middle, does help us raise the relative humidity. In this case, the house is still not really getting what I would consider particularly cold. It's maybe getting to kind of 17, 18 degrees at this point. But compared to the kind of 22, 23 that the rest of the house is in terms of being overheated, it really helps us. And potentially we can start to move more of the house onto this kind of conservation heating approach, which is a long term aspiration. Then we can also start to make more of those of the display areas more hospitable for the collections that are on display. We can also use our monitoring to look at what's going on and how well it's working. So here, a storeroom again at Apsley House. 
where essentially the humidifier hasn't been filled up. And you can see, because of those high temperatures that we still have in the basement, as soon as it runs out of water, the relative humidity level basically plummets, and we hit those kind of slightly frightening, if you're a conservator, dry levels. Um, it quite often can get as low as 20% RH, which for those of you that do conservation, you'll know is kind of starting to dry everything out and crack it. Um, and also leads to quite big spikes in our data. We want to keep it ideally much more kind of stable than these spikes are causing. As part of, um, I suppose, every museum this year has done some sort of coronation um, exhibition. Apsley House had a, uh, an exhibition of the Duke of Wellington's coronation robes um, on the first floor in one of the display areas, which showed the first Duke's um, coronation robes along with those of his two sons who were pages. And you can see the various textile elements, the various um, costume. This has a huge amount of silver threads on the costume. They're in, almost impossible to clean because of the way that they're attached to the textile elements. And so this was something that we really didn't want to be affected by the pollution levels that we know we have on site. This is where our damage functions can come in. We have a damage function for silver tarnish. We can estimate from various different parameters where we've previously done monitoring campaigns for the pollution level and our temperature and relative humidity, what our tarnish rate is likely to be. And we can see that pretty much every month we're looking at about 140 Armstrongs or for the, two th the six month exhibition around 732 Armstrongs. And this can, to give you kind of a sense of comparison, we were having a similar exhibition at Audley End House, which is in Essex. And we were looking at more like 12 Armstrongs over two months. So it's much kind of greater level of tarnish. And as a result, we went for active control. Generally within English Heritage, because of that geographical spread, we prefer to go with passive control. We don't want to have to be going to site to turn things on and off and fix them because we can't get access in the same way. Um, and I'll touch upon that again in a minute. But this is somewhere that's quite central. It's quite easy to get. And because of the situation, we kind of needed to go with this option. So we have an RK2, which will both humidify, dehumidify, it's essentially like a mini air conditioning system for the display case, but crucially for us, also it is filtration. So that gives us the pollution filtration that we need, removes those sulfide gases, we'll also remove a whole host of other gases, thankfully. Um, and that means that we can keep it not just nice and stable in terms of the environment, if we look at the data, you can see a nice flat line. Um, but also, crucially, is filtering out that pollution that we know is present, and that will help, for, help prevent any tarnish to those silver threads. Um, I'm not really going to talk very much about light, but just to say that this is also demonstrating our light control is working. We have showcase lights. We also are controlling the, the windows. We essentially, we're reliant on daylight in a lot of our gallery spaces, and so we're using our blinds to control the daylight, and it's showing that we're meeting the light levels that we'd set for the exhibition. We're able to control that. You can see the days that the exhibition is open and the days that it's closed quite clearly in terms of the data pattern. So a slightly different way that we use data for exhibitions. This is Baird's Oswald Roman Fort um, up on Hadrian's Wall. And this is the old exhibition. We, this is, was very dated. There was a desire to take it out for lots of different reasons. And as part of this, the whole room was going to be essentially taken away. This was a first floor room. We were removing that first floor. We were completely renovating the space. And so what environment are we going to have in our new museum? How are we going to work with kind of what we have in terms of our new exhibition and how we control that environment? This is our new exhibition. And I'm going to focus on this little display case, which is just here which contains archaeological metals. English Heritage has a huge collection of archaeological metals, and we're possibly slightly unusual compared to a lot of museums that display archaeological metals in that most of ours aren't treated. So we rely on keeping them dry, and that means for us, below 30% relative humidity if they're on display, which usually means a lot of silica gel. And as a result, we've developed spreadsheets that we can put in environmental data and model what will happen in that display case. How long are we going to have to keep it dry for? How long before we have to go to site to change the silica gel? Because as I said, that means potentially somebody getting across the country. Even though we're regionally based, somebody's still got to get up to Hadrian's Wall if we need to change the silica gel. So you put in the case dimensions up here. You can put in how much silica gel. You can put in your air exchange rate, which is something that we measure for all of our display cases so we know how tightly sealed they are. You can put in your star RH of your silica gel, which we usually assume that dry means 5% RH, and it will tell you how long it takes to get to 30% RH, which is the point we'd say we have to change it. So in this model, 
this is 12 sheets because I sent you it's 12 years. I've had to keep repeating it in order to get up to 30% 30, uh, 30 RH, partly because we didn't have the, enough information about what the environment was going to be like with the new control. We were having to make assumptions, and that meant slightly over-engineering. We possibly could have gone with less silica gel than the two kilos that this case has. Um, but we can see from the real data, this is six years' worth of data. We've gone from 0% RH to 5% RH, somewhere in the region of 30 years before we need to possibly change the silica gel. We'll probably have changed the exhibition by that point, but it, it kind of really shows you how we can do it. The other thing to note for anyone who's kind of slightly geeky about this, oh, sorry if I go back, is these spikes here are when they've opened the display cases. So I know when my curator has been looking at things because I can physically see it in the data. Um, Final example is St. Mary's Church, Studley Royal, which has an incredible set of stained glass windows, but something that's actively deteriorating. They've been assessed by the York Glaziers Trust. They can see ongoing loss of the enamel paint details within the surface of the, um, the decorative figures. So it's not just the, the kind of coloured glass. They actually have painted details that emphasise things like the hair and the face, and those are being lost. And so as part of this, we carried out some monitoring of the stained glass windows, which is something I've done elsewhere as well as at English Heritage. And here we're looking at both temperature and relative humidity in the space, but we're also looking close to the windows. We're also looking at the surface temperature on the windows and surface wetness. So if I show a slightly zoomed appearance, our dew point temperature is in blue. Our surface temperature of the actual glass is in pink. And you can see that every time that pink line drops below the blue line, we're getting increases in the surface wetness on the, on, the, on the stained glass windows. And that's important because the wetness is what's causing the corrosion of the glass. It's what's helping to break down those painted details. So the less, the less condensation we get on the windows, the less corrosion there's going to be of those windows as well, the less damage to the, the surface. So there was some predictions done by one of my colleagues that showed the amount of time, unfortunately, in his case, missing data for the north window, although from previous experience, we know that the north window will generally be wettest for longest. Um, and that shows, as you'd also expect, that the south window has the lowest amount of condensation risk. And this information was used by the York Glaziers Trust to make a prediction about how the deterioration would go on and what they could do about it. And they've recommended something called protective glazing, where you essentially move your stained glass window, you remove it from the building and put it inside, kind of mounted just inside the window on a uh, little set of brackets. And then you put new glass, and there's various different ways of doing the new glass to kind of make it disappear. But you put new glass into the window. And that difference, particularly this kind of airflow around the window gap, allows you to prevent condensation on that window that's now inside and therefore warmer than it would be if it was on an external face. It also obviously means it's no longer subject to weathering on the outside and all of those things as well. So this is something that's still a work in progress, but as part of this, we can also monitor things like air velocity, so we can check, are those ventilation rates sufficient? Are they gonna help us dry that condensation? And you can see here in blue, the um, south-facing window, which gets much higher levels of ventilation, much faster air speeds compared to the north window, and this is part of the reason why you get more condensation on the north face compared to the south face because those that ventilation is less and so that condensation doesn't dry in the same way so in terms of the types of monitoring we do at english heritage we tend to use two different types of systems radio telemetry systems and standalone data loggers and we use them in different situations and different locations for different reasons standalone data loggers have the advantage of relatively minimal maintenance for us that's perfect we don't have to go to site too often we don't have to physically go and engage with them very often and they're giving us continuous readings however they still do require us to go to site to download it to get the data off it and by that point three six twelve months after it was installed we're seeing something that's historic we're not seeing live data we're not seeing live events and potentially crucially for us if a battery fails potentially you lose all your data on your data logger as well which can be quite frustrating when you need that data for a specific project or to help us answer a specific question. Radio telemetry systems have the advantage of being essentially automated. The data is uh, readily accessible. We can see it live. We can do live manipulation if we need to. We can then monitor those control methods. You know, is my humidifier working? Is my dehumidifier on? Is it doing what I think it should be? If I've got a major storm, can I check what's going on? Does it look like the RH has rocketed as a result? 
Also, for a lot of the systems, we can add multiple sensors. So as I showed, we've got not just temperature and relative humidity and light, but we've also got things like surface wetness, surface temperature. We have weather stations. Um, they can do energy monitoring. So it gives us that option to do quite a lot of different types of monitoring within one system at a site. For us, one of the crucial things is often the range. So our buildings are historic. They are damp. They often have steel hidden in them that you wouldn't know because they were falling down. Embankments at some point in the Ministry of Works have shored them up. And they all affect the radio telemetry signal. They all affect how well that data gets back to your receiver. And so for us, having decent range, having that long distance, and it can be an advantage and a disadvantage, but it can mean for us that we do get a signal back through the building. Um, it can also be a disadvantage. So um, we heard earlier on from Wren about the Mary Rose. We actually pick up the data from the Victory ship over on the Alawite in Osborne House, and we actually get signal interference, and we've had to actually renumber all of the sensors in the kind of the historic dockyard because we were getting clashes of the data. We similarly have the same problem at Rangers, which is right next to the Royal Observatory. We both have MECO systems. We've had a kind of gentleman's agreement over who will use which numbers so that we don't end up getting each other's data. So it can also be a hindrance. Because there's bits more kit with the radio telemetry, it also means it's more expensive. So for small scale monitoring campaigns, it's not necessarily very useful. And we can get data transmission issues, potentially if the building suddenly gets wet or is very damp, you suddenly find your signal disappears or you move the sensor one inch to the left and suddenly you've got no data. So there are kind of benefits of using it and not. Generally, we tend to use more expensive and better quality RH probes because they minimise calibration issues for us. They minimise how long we have to go before we need to go to site. Um, and also, they tend to survive better in damp environments, which we have quite a lot of. So they, for us, save us a lot of time, even though initially they're more expensive. One of the downsides, I was asked to kind of talk about some of the impacts. And one of the downsides is almost all of these sensors have their own software. I've got about 15 different programmes on my desktop, all just for environmental monitoring of sorts. Um, they're often quite limited in the functionality, which can also be a problem because you often then have to export the data and actually analyze it in something else, um, particularly if you need to do anything beyond the basic. Here's a graph. Here's my basic stats. So that can be quite limiting. We then have data management issues. Um, and in English Heritage, this is a particular issue. It can be stored on the cloud. It can be stored on a local machine, on a network drive, somebody's pen drive you know, a computer that they've not accessed recently. They can be in all sorts of places because we need to go to sites. We don't necessarily have decent network access because a lot of our sites are very remote. So you can't necessarily rely on something like Wi-Fi being there and uploading it magically to the, you know, it doesn't necessarily work. So our limitations often pre prevent kind of what I would quali um, qualify as good data management. Um, and also there's a volume issue. We've got about a thousand sensors currently nationally some of which we've got about 20 years of data for, some of which we've got more. So there's quite a big volume of data. Also training issues, a lot of our team don't use these systems very frequently, so they're not necessarily going to know how to set it up or how to use it on site. So as a result, we've tried to create help sheets, we've tried to create ways that anyone can pick it up and use it without really having to need any extra training. And where we have got active control, we need to be aware of that maintenance issue. So we have to train a site team to be able to do the day-to-day -day management because I'm not going up to Hadrian's Wall every day to fill up something with water. Um, and we tend to try and put in a passive backup. So usually we give ourselves a month. That's what we aim for. So if something goes down, something breaks, we know we've got that passive backup to supply the next month. We know we're not going to kind of fail to meet our requirements. Things aren't going to have to be decanted out of display cases, for example. It means that we've then got that back up to give us time to fix it and to sort it out. Um, I'm going to finish with some acknowledgements and just say if anyone does want to get in touch, please feel free. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Naomi? Hi. Um I'm interested in your passive backups and whether you use recording thermohygrographs. Whether we use... Recording thermohygrographs. No. You I don't want any, then? <laughs> no. We've got, we've, got, um, we've got some as kind of demonstrations, which we use for students, as to kind of how they were used, but we almost all of our sensors now are electronic. We don't have any. So when you say passive backups, do you mean just standalone data loggers? 
No, passive backup as in if we've got an active control system, we would have something like silica gel or prosorb in the case as well. Oh, okay. So, yeah, we don't have a kind of supplementary monitoring system there. Yeah, what we've got is a supplementary control system. So if something goes down, in theory, we've got that time to you know, get an engineer to site or we've got time for us to go to site because my diary book's three to six months in advance and I can't just go next Tuesday because somebody else happens to be on site. Um, so it gives us that kind of option without having to be like, right, everyone get there tomorrow because we need to decant the display case and that means we're all trekking up to Hadrian's Wall or the Isles of Scilly or wherever it happens to be. So, yeah, it's, it's more about kind of a sustainable way of, which is partly why we tend to go for passive control methods. For us, that's a more sustainable way of controlling a lot of our display cases, but it doesn't necessarily always work for all situations and all display cases or all lenders or, you know, you have to be flexible. Uh, I'm, I'm interested about the uh, colorful sort of windows in the church. Uh, I mean, eventually some of them will, will damage, the, you know. Uh, in terms of the cost effectiveness, uh, it might be, sort of just replace them. But I, I know you, you probably want to reserve the, the old one, but, but in terms of the, the looking, it w won't, won't affect it because people don't climb up to, to see the windows. So this is something that is, the, d the details that are being lost, the, there's kind of two elements to it. And it, it, I should have said it's really dependent on actually the glass composition as well. So there's essentially medieval stained glass, which is particularly susceptible. And then there's also some 19th century glass of which Studley Royal is, is in that group that's also susceptible. Um, the painted details can be seen from the ground because of the height of the windows. So you are losing information that people can see. And it's something that we can preserve by making this change to the building. And it's something that they've done quite a lot with medieval stained glass. So in this case, we're losing painted details. A lot of medieval stained glass, you've already lost those painted details. They've long since kind of disappeared. But there, what you've often got is that the condensation means it's actually eating holes in the glass. So it's also no longer weather, weatherproof in a way. They do occasionally repair or replace, you know, individual pieces of glass within windows. But as a whole, it's seen as part of the church. It's part of the listed kind of status normally. It's part of the, you know, they've been created in the case of Studley Royal. I can't remember the name of the artist, but it's a specific artist that has created them as well. So you couldn't just kind of recreate if you've already actually got something that you can, we have a way of protecting. So the, the first step would always be to try and protect what we have and then only essentially if it's gone far too far down the line of being deteriorated, that then we might consider recreation or kind of replicas. Where we tend to use recreations or replicas is more where we're trying to dress a space and show how it would have been in the medieval period. And we don't necessarily have any furniture or anything, so then we would potentially create replicas. Or re follow on what I, I, was mentioning. Um, I, I, I mean, the, you may be able to do some study about the old... Uh, sort of works, uh, the replicate, reproduct, if you do something, and they will be probably more or less identical. I think that's overlooking the hand of the artist in creating the painted details <laughs> somewhat. <laughs> but yes, potentially. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering about the fluctuation you're having in some of your ambient spaces. Have you had good conversations with like volunteers and visitor assistants for making sure that things like blinds are cut, like shut down and doors are closed, just because the fluctuation didn't actually seem that extreme in a lot of your ambient spaces. It, it very much depends on which of our ambient spaces you're looking at. Um, some of our spaces we've done quite well at getting things like doors closed. At Apsy House, when I first started, the front door was left open, because how are visitors going to get in if the front door isn't open? Um, we have collections just inside the door. Um, we finally managed to get them to put a sign on the door that says, open, please knock. It's made a huge difference, and actually it works. You know, visitors see a sign and they go, oh, okay, I can go in. Um, but actually it's almost like persuading visitor services side of things that it, it will be effective and it will work. And now because we've got it in a couple of sites, we've managed to say, well, we've got it here and it works. So, you know, um, it doesn't always work. We've got some sites, so Rest Park, we've got a, 
um, was what's called the Arches Pavilion, which has got incredibly important wall paintings at the end of the long gallery, at the end of the long water, rather. Um, it's not somewhere that we can invigilate. It's too far away. You know, the gardeners maybe only get there once a day to unlock it and lock it again. We've put signs on the doors. We know from the monitoring we've done, they're not necessarily, the public isn't always closing them, and it doesn't necessarily always work where you've got lots of people in a space. But we have things like blind plans so that we can try and control the light. And if it gets really sunny, please do this. If it gets really dark, please do this. And it kind of shows literally a physical picture of the window and where the blind should be, depending on the weather. Um, so we've tried to make it as simple as possible, but there are other graphs where the fluctuations would not look so pretty. <laughs> so, yeah. That was really interesting, thank you. Um, I just had a question about your continuous corrosion monitoring, um, the length of that program that you run, and at what point it can inform your um, tarnish rates that you're calculating? So they've all run for slightly different, frustratingly all run for slightly different lengths of time. So sometimes it's just put out for a month as a short-term test, you know, how much corrosion are we getting over the course of that 30 days? always caveated that we know with warmer temperatures in the summer we're likely to get higher rates because we get higher levels of pollution versus the winter and actually when can you do the monitoring is not necessarily always going to be the height of summer or the warmest temperatures so we always kind of have a slight caveat in some of our sites we have got longer term they have been out for longer periods primarily where they've been part of big research projects so sometimes we've had kind of like three years worth of continuous monitoring because the project happened to be three years and then at the end of the project it's been taken away again it really depends on why we've put it out and what the question is and part of that so like with the carpet it was just for a week's test we ran the underfloor heating for a week we ran the corrosion monitors in two different locations in the house for a week and from that we were kind of making a judgment because we had to proceed with the project so Ideally, we try to get a year's worth of data for lots of our activities, but in many cases, we're making decisions on much less data because of practicalities. Thank you. Uh, yeah, a quick question about the pollution at Apsley House. Is it just permeating the building, or is it just by the windows? I'm just curious. It permeates the building. So it's much. we get much higher levels by the windows, um, and we also get... Um, more destructively maybe for the collections in the short term. We get quite a lot of diesel particulates coming in through the windows as well. So they leave kind of very sooty, greasy particulates, which are very difficult to clean off things like textiles. Um, and we've done campaigns of dust monitoring to be able to kind of look at those and identify where they are and where they're coming in. There is current discussions about whether we can improve the dust seals on the windows, which has been a long-term aspiration. But again, that means making changes to something that's protected and listed and therefore you can't just kind of suddenly tape something up or you know stick something on it's a much longer process and it often requires part of why it's come up at the moment is that we're going to do window repairs so if we're doing the window repairs anyway and we've got to go through the process of getting consent can we put the dust seals in as a kind of a, an additional stage at that point and it doesn't add a, a huge amount of additional work to different people's workloads um, the pollution monitoring is kind of ongoing, and I think we were answering this here at the moment, which is one of our researchers, and we were talking recently about potential changes and whether actually things like congestion charge and new lasers had an impact, and that's something that we'd kind of like to go back at and have a look and see how much can we see a change in the pollution levels that we're recording at Apsley as a result of those kind of monitoring campaigns, because a lot of it is traffic driven. A lot of it is from catalytic converters because there's a set of traffic lights outside. They give off um, hydrogen, sulf yeah, hydrogen sulfide when they're sat still, and that then tarnishes the silver. So part of it's also about where it's coming from, which we obviously can't move the house, but we can potentially do other things in terms of sealing that might help. Okay, I, th I think I think we'll probably all stop there. You've you've certainly sparked off sparked off a, a lot of, a lot of questions, but uh, any questions uh, you can ask ask uh, and, and Naomi afterwards. Can we thank her again, please? <laughs> so that 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 brings us to the end of the day. So I'd, I'd like to thank everyone who who has spoken and thank you thank you for your questions and and for the discussion we have had outside. I'd like to speak thank the, the speakers the. The, uh, the, the the people who have presented presented posters and thank you all for for attending.